Okay, folks. As I was running through my checklist in my head, I think I've got everything. I've got the Zoom logged in. I've got the recording going, this damn beeping is people joining in. I have no idea how to turn it off right now. I don't want to deal with it. So that's people joining the Zoom session. Um, okay. What about the camera? What about the camera? Oh, uh, pointing to the, I guess the, the projector. I mean, it's not really, yeah, not really absolutely necessary, but. It's in there, so. I think so. I don't know. It's no, I think that I think it's getting recorded. So basically, as long as my you know, clearly recording me walking around doesn't matter as much as the slides. So let's get started. There are a couple of things relating to the the kind of logistics of the class that I didn't quite get to last session that I want to kind of get out of the way. Last session, I talked about the class, but I never got around to talking about how you're going to get graded and what you need to do on the class, right? In fact, I want to start with whether you need a book for the class, and the answer is no. I have five different books on valuation. I've described them all. If you want to get them, fine. If you don't want to get them, fine. You can live perfectly well without the books. So uh, depending on how much money you have to spend, the books range from small to large, cheap to expensive. So books, if you, if you need them, you're welcome to, to, to get them. Um, in terms of uh, quizzes and exams, there'll be three quizzes in this class and a final exam. Okay. The three quizzes will each be what? This is driving me crazy. The three quizzes will each be worth 10%. The, the dates of the quizzes are in your syllabus. They're also in the calendar for the class. So check them out right now. They're each 10%. Now I'm a realist. I know that things will get in the way and some of you might have to miss a quiz. And if you do, you will not lose the 10%. It'll get moved to whatever's left in the class. You know what I mean by left in the class? If you miss the first quiz, the 10% will be moved to the other two quizzes and finally, if you miss the second quiz, we move to the third quiz in the final. We miss the third quiz, everything goes in the final because otherwise you get strategic quiz missing, which is if I let you wait backwards, if you do really well in the first two quizzes, you can say, I'll miss the third quiz. This way it's always going to be on what's left in the class. The quizzes are open book, open notes. For the moment, they're in person quizzes in class but I will get two other rooms on the quiz dates because in the first 30 minutes of class each day, not the whole class, I'll get two other rooms so that you're all not crowded next to each other. Taking a quiz in this room for 350 people is my definition of hell. So I will tell you about, I will move about 150 of you to other rooms so that we have enough room to spread out. Now, some of you, if you're entirely online, you're physically unable to make the class, we'll talk about what to do, but but the classes, at, the, at least for the moment, the quizzes and exams are online. So three quizzes, 10%, final 30%, all open book, open notes. That brings us to 60%, right? Saying what's the remaining 40% for? It's what this class is all about. I mean, the end game for this class is I want you to be able to value companies. So your project, 
and that I want to spend just a couple of minutes on it, is to talk about what exactly does that involve. So this is a group project. So first thing is you need to find a group. Many of you, if you know each other, already know who you want to hang out with, who you don't want in your group, I'm going to let you pick your own groups. In fact, I will not put you in groups because then you will blame me if something goes wrong. I do also know that some of you don't know anybody in the class. You're an exchange student. I will be creating an orphan Google shared spreadsheet. And here's what I want to do. If you cannot find a group, go put yourself on the orphan list. One of two things will happen to you. Either a group will adopt you out of pity or sympathy or whatever, or more likely what will happen is you'll have enough people on the orphan list that you can free, create a group of orphans. Kind of sad statement, <laughs> you know, but hey, you know what? This is my way of kind of making sure that you find each other. Okay, so I will send you the link for the Google shared spreadsheet with the, with the orphans and you should be able to get in a group. Once you get in a group, each of you, let me be very specific, each of you picks a company. So there's no benefit to forming a group of seven or three, if you have seven people, you have seven companies, three people, three companies. Now, each of you will pick a company. And the project itself is due in two parts. The first half is, guys, mute yourself if you're coming in. The first half is actually going to be your discounted cash flow valuation. It's due on April 1st at 5 p.m., that's a Friday. It will not be graded. It's a feedback, so, so you can turn it in. I do it partly to encourage you to keep up with the project because this way you have an incentive to get the valuation done rather than put it off. So it's purely for feedback. I look over your valuation and say, maybe you want to tweak this, or I might just say, look, this looks perfect, move on. The entire project is due on the last day of class, which is May 9th, by 5 p.m. that day. It is a group project, but each of you will be valuing your companies. There's relatively little group work. Say, why put a group structure? Well, it might be useful for you to sound things off with a group so you can, if you have trouble, you can work it out as a group. But each of you is responsible for your company. And the final project will be graded as a group project with one grade for everybody in the group. And please, no coming in and saying, look, I did all the work. They just hang around. Why don't you give me the A, give them the Cs? It doesn't work that way. Life is full of group projects where some people carry more weight than others. So it is a group project for 40%. So 60% from the quizzes and the exams and 40% from the final project. Any questions about the logistics? So when do you need to start doing this? Right now. If you're not in a group, start thinking about a group. But even before you get in a group, you might want to think about the company you're going to value because I'm going to put some constraints on what types of companies you can and cannot pick. You can pick any company you want, but here are the constraints. The constraints are group-wide constraints. At least one company is to be a money-losing company. So you want to pick Peloton or you want to pick you know, Airbnb, a money-losing company. Or you can pick a company like United Airlines, that's also a money losing company. So at least one company has to be a money losing company based on the most recent 12 months of data. At least one company has to have high growth potential with growth, growth defined in terms of revenues. So you can have a money losing company with high revenue growth. At least one company has to be a non-US company. And I'd like you to do the valuation in local currency terms if you can. Of course, the exception might be if you decide to pick Alibaba as your, as your non-US company, the ADR is listed in the US, the financials might be in dollars, you might decide to do it in dollars, but I'd much rather that you do the valuation in local currency. And at least one of these companies should be a service company, but kind of ignore that constraint because 90% of companies out there are service companies. So really one foreign company, one money losing company, one growth company. And of course, you can meet multiple constraints with one company, right? So if you pick a company like Airbnb, you've got your high growth money losing company, which is also a service company. 
So it doesn't have to be that each company meets one constraint. You can meet multiple constraints with one company. So that's really the project will run through the entire semester. This is what I will nag you about every week for the next 15 weeks. So I'll ask you, where are you in the project? What are you doing? Everything we do in the class, you're gonna do on your company. Is a question? Yeah, um, you haven't specified the maximum amount of people in the group and minimum. Maximum and minimum. At the minimum, I'd like at least four. Maximum for your own sake, I would say keep it to seven. If you really, really, really like that eighth person, let them in. But get you know, getting an eight-person project together is like herding, herding cats, especially in that last week getting it done. So Jeff, for your own sake, I wouldn't let the group get much bigger than eight. Any other questions on the project or the logistics of the class? So quizzes and exams, open book, open notes. Basically, you can bring in book, whatever you want to do. No, not open laptops yet because I still can't figure out how to turn off the Wi-Fi. If I cannot, crazy things can happen with, with laptops. So no laptops yet. Okay, so there are no questions. I'm gonna start this class by doing something you're gonna see me start every class with. So here's what I'm going to do at the start of every class. At the start of every class, I'm going to start the class with a quiz. Again, don't freak out. No grades. So if you do badly, nobody's going to come down on you. And you know what the quiz is going to be about? It's going to be about what we're going to do in the upcoming class. That sounds strange, right? To quiz you on something we haven't done yet. But I'll tell you my rationale. Nothing in valuation, as I said last session, is rocket science. Anybody should be able to figure it out. So my reason for giving you the start of the class quiz is to tell you that you can reason your way to what we will come up with as answers later in the class. So you see in a sense that you use common sense, you can pretty much reason your way to the answer to almost every question in valuation. So at the start of every class, I'll do the start of the class class, and then I'll send you this, the solution will also be online. So we've gone to the web page with the links to the class, you'll see the start of the class test with the solution. One of the things we're going to talk about today is how every valuation you see is permeated with bias. You know what I mean by bias? I mean, I told each, each of you has to pick a company, right? Already you're starting to think, what company do I want to pick? Think about what goes into that process. How you come up with a company name? Some of you might pick a company because you used to work for the company. Some of you might pick a company because you like Elon Musk, in which case I predict which company you're going to pick. It's going to be Tesla. Some of you might pick a company because you've read a news story last week, Netflix, because it dropped 20%. Already the seeds of bias are being planted, right? You pick the company, not randomly, but because of some direction you got from something. Then once you pick the company, you're not starting with a blank slate. If you pick Netflix, the fact that you saw money heist and it pissed you off might affect your valuation. You see, that makes no sense. But almost everything you know about the company is going to start to affect your valuation. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be honest with yourself when you pick your company. Be honest with yourself in what sense. I want you to write on paper and save it someplace safe. What do you think you're going to find in your valuation? Sounds like you're saying, I haven't done the work yet. Just make, your, make a state, it's called stating your priors. Tell me what you think you're going to find in your valuation. It's going to be undervalued, overvalued. File that away at the end of the semester, once you value the company, compare what you found to what you expected to find. And if you get paid to do valuation, then the bias kind of explodes on you. In fact, to show you, how when somebody values a company, bias can enter in. I'm going to throw a series of scenarios at you. And with each one, I want you to tell me whether your bias is going to be to push the number up, the number down, or you think you're going to be unbiased. So here's the first scenario. 
You're the owner of a business. You're valuing your own business for sale to another person or for a venture capitalist to invest in. Is your bias going to be to push the value up, value down, or in effect? What do you think? Up. up. And why? You want to sell it. You want to get the highest price. If you're a venture capitalist looking at exactly the same company with the same numbers, your bias is going to be to lower it because you want to get a bigger percentage of the company in return for your investment. Think of it as Shark Tank, right? If you ask me for 500,000 for 5%, I don't offer you 500,000 for 2%. I mean, it, it, or 500,000. So I want to put the value lower because I get a higher percent of the company. So already you can see how VCs and founders, you're going to see the two sides push in opposite directions. Now let's make it a little more cynical. You're valuing your own business or in the verge of a divorce, you're having a midlife crisis. <laughs> Whatever value you attach to the business, half that value is going to go to your soon to be ex-spouse and you really don't like her or him very much anymore. What's your bias going to be? Well, you can lower it because then- In fact, you want to convince the world you're worth nothing. <laughs> There's a guy called Henry Ham. Texas used to own an oil company, got into a nasty divorce. And here's what he told the court. I'm a terrible business person. This business is worth nothing. Half of nothing is nothing. So I own nothing. Of course, the court didn't agree with them. But you can see very quickly which side of the divorce you're coming from, whether you're the one claiming the half or having to pay the half, you're going to get very different answers. Now let's move on. You know that 70% of all appraisals of private companies or for tax purposes. So you're the owner of a business. You've hired me as your appraiser. I'm going to appraise the value of your business. And then the tax guy is going to take away 30% of that value. It happens in inheritance. It happens often in capital gains. You see what the bias is going to be? To come up with as low a value as you can, because then you pay less. But if you're the appraiser for the IRS looking at exactly the same company, you're going to push value up. Already you're going to see this play out in how appraisers at private companies try to attach value and reduce that value and how the IRS pushes back because they're very different biases. How many of you are familiar with how equity research is structured? What, there, there are two types of equity research analysts, sell side, and buy side. Can anybody tell me the difference between the two types? What's the difference between the sell side equity research analyst and the buy side? Yes. It's not so much independence. It's whether you're investing your own money or whether you're just offering investment advice. A sell side equity research analyst work for a Goldman Sachs, a JP. They're the ones you read about in the Wall Street Journal. They put buy and sell recommendations and then they offer it to clients who can do whatever they want. They can buy or sell, but they offer just investment advice. Buy side analysts work for Fidelity or State Street or one of the mutual funds. They do research, but they do it for internal purposes so that the mutual fund managers can decide what to buy or sell. So sell side versus buy side. This is a question about sell side equity research. Sell side equity research, often you're given a sector to follow. You're told that these are the 20 companies I want you to track. And you're stuck with those 20 companies in a sense for the rest of your life. You're the steel company analyst, you're gonna be looking at those 20 companies. That's gonna become part of the story. You're a sell side equity research analyst valuing a company for putting out investment recommendations, do you think there's going to be a potential for bias when you put buy and sell recommendations? And if so, why? Want to try? Uh, I think it's going to be uncertain whether it's uh, high or low, depending more or less on whether you're buying or What did I say about these 20 companies? You're going to track them for the rest of your life, right? How do you get information on these companies? Past data. Well, past data, but you also try to feel out the company management, I know inside information is illegal, but part of it is just that informal connection to the company, right? What do you think is gonna happen 
right after you put a sell recommendation on a company. Some of those people who used to talk to you when you called them, now they hang up the phone on you. In other words, the quickest way to burn your bridges, burn your contact, is to put a sell, sell recommendation on a stock. You know that buy recommendations from sales side analysts outnumber sell recommendations nine to one? Wow. This has always been the case. In fact, it used to be 20 to one before 2001, they did some, some, some degree of correction. Nine to one still. You can't tell me there are nine times as many stocks you can buy than sell. There's clearly some bias in this process where you don't like to say the word sell. So sell side equity research analysts have become pretty sneaky about how they tell you to sell. Any ideas on how you can tell somebody to sell without ever using the word sell? One is you put companies into numerical classes. One, two, three, four, five. And you say, look, we've moved the stock from one to two or two to three, implicitly hoping. What's the other? Hold is kind of a shape. But also you have strong buy, weak buy. This is kind of, I call these queasy words. Basically, I don't even know what it means. When you buy, you buy or sell. What's a strong buy? You hit the keyboard a little harder. <laughs> you yell a little more. I mean, what exactly does that mean? But essentially, it then allows an analyst to say, I've lowered this company from a strong buy to a weak buy. You know what the message he hopes you get out of this, right? Go sell the stock right away. But already you can see how the bias of having to deal with these companies can affect how you value the companies and what kind of recommendations you do. Any follow-ups on sell side equity? So sell side equity research, you can see the bias towards bias. Yes. I would also say like, even though they technically have like a, you know, like like a firewall they're supposed to like uh, you know they also provide underwriting services and like obviously like no one wants to do an ipo with a company that like it's going to then later like tell everyone to sell your stock in other words if morgan stanley's tesla's native investment banker and the morgan stanley equity research analyst it's going to be very difficult for you to say sell tesla because you have other banking relationships in theory it shouldn't affect you but you can see in practice it does now let's move to M&A. In M&A, there's an acquiring firm and there's a target firm. The acquiring firm has its own banker, the target firm has its own banker. And in a sense, it's a very difficult transaction to get away with because you've got to justify both sides that this transaction is good for them. So let's say you're the M&A analyst, you're working for the investment banker for the acquirer. So keyword is you're working for the acquirer. It's a friendly takeover. You might wonder why that matters. You're going to see in a minute why that might affect your value, valuing the target company. So is your bias going to be to push up the value, push down the value, or is there no bias? Let me ask you a question. Do you want the deal to go through? That's how you make money, right? So let's put that on the table, that in a friendly merger, everybody in the room wants the deal to go through. So you got to convince the acquiring company shareholders that they're going to get a good deal from this transaction, right? And to do that, what do you have to show about the value of the target company? That it's higher than the price you're paying or lower than the price? If you tell them it's lower than the price, the shareholders think, well, why the hell are you doing that? If you're Microsoft shareholders and I came to you and said, look, I think Activision is worth 50 billion. We've decided to pay 75 billion. You'd fire me on the spot, right? So I have to convince you that I'm the value is higher than what you're paying. So you want to bias the value up. How do you do that? You might attach control premiums. There's a lot of premium in m and because you've got to get a higher number. But here's the tricky thing. If you're the m and analyst working for the target company, what do you have to convince them? Is there, if, if you told them your company's really worth 100 billion, Microsoft is paying 75 billion, what are your shareholders going to tell, ask you? Why are you selling so low, right? So the bankers working for the target company have to convince them at exactly the same time that the deal that the acquiring company banker said was a good deal is also a good deal for them. So they've got to convince the target company shareholders to do exactly the same thing. Value is higher than the price. You're getting a good deal too. I'm sorry, value is lower than the price. You're getting a really good deal. You think, how can 
value be both low and high? You know what allows both bankers to walk away saying this? Magic words like synergy. And here's why synergy works, right? Let's say both the acquiring company bank and the target company banker agree that 60 billion is the right value for Activision. The acquiring banker then throws a $30 billion premium on top of the synergy here. That's why Microsoft can afford to pay 75 billion. And because Activision cannot create that synergy, they say, look, we're going to compare it to 60 billion. I know it's game play, but you can see how bias plays out. That's a friendly merger. Now let's turn to hostile acquisition. In a hostile acquisition, the game changes, right? Here, the target company's bankers want to convince their shareholders not to sell. So if you are the acquiring company here, you still want to point your shareholders that it's a good deal. But if you are the target company's banker now, you now share the same bias that the acquiring company's banker does, which is say, look, they're paying you too little. Don't sell to these guys. M&A is one of the messiest processes in valuation. I'm going to come back and talk about why so many screw-ups happen. But already you can see the, how the bias in this game alters how you do things. Final example, you're a buy-side analyst. So you work for Fidelity. Remember, your only client now is the portfolio manager you work for. You're valuing a company for your portfolio manager who already owns a million shares of the stock. Just put this, give the stock a name, Walmart. Your portfolio manager loves Walmart, owns a million shares. He or she asks you to value Walmart and you value Walmart. What kind of result is your portfolio manager going to be happiest with when you come into the office and say, here's what I found. That you found Walmart to be undervalued or overvalued? They want it to be undervalued because they want you to confirm that what you did, what they did was the right thing. I mean, if you go back and say, you think, oh, you know what? I think Walmart is overvalued. The price is higher than the value. The person owns a million shares of Walmart. He can do one of two things, right? He can sell the million shares and pat you on the back, or he can fire you and replace you with another analyst who gives him a different answer or a different, so you can justify holding on to a million shares. And of course, if your portfolio is sold short on the stock, then the opposite results are going to kick in. I mean, people want confirmation. What I'm trying to say in a long, a long winded way is people claim to want your honest opinion. Don't believe them. They want to hear what will make them happy. This is, I think, at the core of why so many debates happen after valuation. Because somebody has a prior and they want you to say, hey, it's okay, you should be buying this company. It is undervalued when in fact, every number you have suggests the exact opposite. I'd like you, as I said, to put your priors down for the company. First, you got to pick a company. Once you pick the company, put your priors down. Coming from what you've read about the company, why you pick the company, and then see if you're biased. Or in fact, it's not it. See how your bias affects the choices you make along the way when you value the company. Any questions on bias? We're going to talk a lot more about bias, but any questions about how bias affects valuations? Okay. So now, to... so now we're going to start on the meat and potatoes part of valuation. This is the first lecture note packet, like the introductory packet. It's not packet one, but the introductory packet. So if you don't have it yet, don't worry. You can download it, print it off when you get a chance. So what I'd like to do for the rest of today is set the table for the class. Talk about the different approaches in a big picture perspective what drives the way we think about value in each approach and why one approach might be better for you than another. As I said, I've been teaching valuation now since 1986. And uh, often I get asked, why do you teach valuation? I could tell them it's my job, but the reality is if I don't believe in valuation, there'd be no point teaching this class. So I'm gonna give you first the reason why I do valuation. 
It's to fight the lemming in me. You, you guys heard of lemmings? Lemmings became famous or infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic filled the most amazing site. Since then, there have been rumors that the whole thing was staged, but let's act like it was a real site. They filmed thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures gathered together on a cliff, run right off the cliff into an ocean and commit collective suicide. Morbid thought, but kind of hang it there. Let's think about why they did. Why do lemmings go off the cliff? Let's do some virtual imagery. You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast. He couldn't stop. He went off the cliff into the ocean. But well, had to be a he, not a she, you know, given that behavior. And given that they don't swim, dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy, also dead. But I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in the group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but kind of hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I would assume you have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Left brain, right brain, whatever part of you is rational saying, stop, don't do it. And then you have this voice in the back of your head. What is it saying? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words, the seven most deadly words in investing and valuation. They must know something that you don't. I'll bring it back to valuation and tell you when I hear that voice. Now I've been valuing Tesla off and on for the last decade. I'm gonna show you some of those valuations. But a few months ago, I valued Tesla. Stock had hit a thousand. I did a discounted cash flow valuation. I tried every optimistic assumption I could. I came up with a value of about $640 per share. Stock trading at 1,000, the value is $640 per share. What's your rational side saying? Don't buy that stock, right? And then this voice in the back of your head pipes up. They must know something that you don't. Speaks in a monotone, don't, don't ask me why. But when you hear that voice, magical things start to happen to your valuation. Your growth rates start to go up, your cash flows start to get bigger, your discount rates start to get lower. It's almost like evaluation is an autopilot moving from 640 to 1,000. If you haven't felt it yet, you will feel it because each of you is going to value your company. And you know the first number you're going to check after you've done your valuation, right? You're going to check the market price. And almost like magic, the market price will come on over, come on over. <laughs> Don't fight it. It's human nature. There's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out. In fact, you can divide the whole group, a whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? You know what momentum investors do? If you're buying, they're buying. If you're selling, they're selling. Why are you buying? I don't care. Proud lemmings, proud to be a lemming. I can't pull off being a proud lemming. The second group of lemmings I call Yogi Bear lemmings. Have you ever seen Yogi Bear co comics? Maybe you saw that ill-fated Yogi Bear movie that came out like 15 years ago. I made the mistake of going to it. But Yogi Bear's most famous saying was he was, he was smarter than the average bear. You know what Yogi Bear lemmings believe they are? They're smarter than the average lemming. Here's what they want to do. They want to run with the crowd to the very edge of the cliff and at the last moment, we are away. Great if you can pull it off, right? You get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Admit it, you're tempted. You're saying, I got into Stern that required a high SAT. I'm smarter than the average person. I'll figure out where the cliff is coming. I'll let you make your own choices, but here's what I've learned. I'm not smarter than the average lemming. I have no idea where the cliff is or when it's coming. So I can't be a proud lemming. I'm not smarter than the average lemming. You want me to categorize myself? That's me right there. A lemming with a life vest. That's all I aspire to be. That's what valuation gives me. It gives me a life vest. It says, look, even if everybody else changes their mind, here's what you can hold on to. I don't do valuations to become rational. 
I can never be rational. You know why? Because I'm a human being. I'm going to be driven by emotions and biases that are far stronger than any rationality I can bring to the game. I'm going to do stupid things because I get caught up in the mood of the moment. All that valuation does is slow the process down, give my rational side a chance to mount an argument. Nine times out of 10, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore my rational side and do whatever I wanted to do. Maybe that one time out of 10 where I listen will save me some money. So don't set your ambitions way up. This class is not going to make you rational. It's not going to make you into a machine. But it'll give you the tools to slow the process down so at least you get a chance to think about what you're planning to do. So I'm going to start by dispensing some mythologies and misconceptions that are widely held in valuation, especially among people who do valuation for a living. Here's the first one. Evaluation is an objective search for the truth that you're some kind of scientist trying to value companies. You know what feeds into this misconception? You sit in front of a computer with an Excel spreadsheet, you start entering numbers, and after a while you convince yourself, look, it's all numbers, I'm being objective, I'm just like a scientist. That's a lie. Here's the truth. Every company you value, the valuation is going to be a biased valuation. Because when you value the company, you bring in everything you know about the company into that valuation, good or bad. I'll give you a personal example. I valued Microsoft every year since 1986. That was the year of their IPO. And between 1986 and 2014, I'll talk about what happened in 2014 that changed the way I think about Microsoft. Every time I valued Microsoft, I found it to be overvalued. Whatever the price, I said, don't buy a terrible company. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equity markets in the 20th century, I wouldn't have touched it one step of the way. Now I could give you access to every single valuation I've done of Microsoft since 1986. You could dig through the models looking for clues. But if you really want to see why I find Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is take the elevator up to the ninth floor, walk, to the doorway of 969, which is my office. Don't go in, it's unlocked, don't do anything crazy. If I'm there, I'll open the door and you walk in, here's what you're gonna see. You're still gonna see an iMac on the table, you're gonna see my MacBook Pro, right next to my MacBook Pro, I've got my iPad and my iPhone. This is Apple territory. And I've been an Apple user, in fact, if you look up towards the top shelf, I still have my first Mac 128K about 1981. It actually still works if any of you are interested in seeing what a computer actually used to look like 40 years ago. I've been an Apple user since 1981. And to me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, I want to be specific. I'm not talking Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader. Cute little boy kind of Darth Vader. I'm talking, so not episodes one, two, three, Think episodes four, five, six. My version of Darth Vader was black, speaks in a whisper, doesn't take a shower. I have a lot of bad thoughts about Bill Gates. And every time I sit down to value Microsoft, all those bad thoughts come spilling out. Because in valuation, you constantly come to forks in the road, right? And you get to pay. And with Microsoft, for most of its life, when I came to that fork in the road, low growth or high growth, my choice was predestined. Who buy this rotten product? Low growth. Low risk or high risk? One virus away from blowing up, high risk. And by the time I make these choices, I'm gonna find the company to be overvalued. In fact, if I dislike Microsoft so much that I can't value, it's too much bias, what's the other company that I can't value? I've kind of given you a clue. I can't value Apple because I love it too much. In fact, if you go to my blog, my first valuation of Apple on my blog was in 2010. I spent half the post telling people not to trust me. So don't trust me, I love this company too much, but I'm gonna try. And that's all you can do, is you cannot make bias go away, but at least you can be open about it. Let me complete the story, see what happened in 2014. 
I actually started to feel sorry for Microsoft. It's very difficult to hate somebody when you feel sorry for them. Because in 2014, it looked like Microsoft's end days were here. You remember, Steve Ballmer had left. Satya Nadella had become the new CEO. Microsoft is still a two-hit wonder. Office and Windows, Windows and Office. They hadn't done anything in 30 years. It actually created value. I mean, you're saying, what about the Xbox? The Xbox has never made Microsoft money. I actually felt sorry for Microsoft. I actually bought Microsoft. Turns out to be one of the best investments I ever made. Shows you how your best investments can come from the worst of models. All valuations are biased because there's never, almost never a valuation when you start with a blank slate. And as we saw with that, that bias sheet, you get paid to do a valuation, God help you. Because I'll make a statement about valuation. This is almost always true. You tell me who pays you to do a valuation and how much you get paid. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. And I'll tell you a story to kind of back this up. It's a company called Lynn Cable, early 1990s, publicly traded company. And AT&T had this option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. Keyword is appraised value. So the time for the option to be exercised comes about. AT&T, I'm sorry, AT&T first goes out and hires Morgan Stanley. So you guys are going to be Morgan Stanley. And you're going to assess the value of Lynn Cable so I can pay for the 49% so you work for the buyer. Lynn Cable went out and hired Lehman Brothers. I'm sorry to do this to you, but think of yourselves as pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. And your job is to take the same company and value the company, but you work for the seller. Morgan Stanley works for the buyer. Lehman works for the seller. One bank came back with $105 per share. The other come, came back with $155 per share. I want you to guess which side came back with the 105 and which one with the 155. Who do you think came back with the 105? The 105 Morgan Stanley, why? Because they work for the buyer, you came back. You did your job. But if you looked at each valuation standing alone, you had spreadsheets and scenario analysis it made it look like they were both objectively valuing the company. In fact, the difference was so large, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why settle for two fees when you can have three, I guess? And they call in this output called Wasserstein Perella. I'm going to say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put in front of them. They'd invent some multiple enterprise value to cash in the bag, 3.3. Next thing you know, you're paying $66 for a $20 bill. <laughs> but if you're Wasserstein Perel, and you guys can be Wasserstein Perel in the middle, you don't want to piss off either side too much, right? Because you've got to work with Morgan Stanley in the future and Lehman in the future. 105, 155. This is the safest place for you to do. 130. 130, right down the middle, right? They came back with $127.52. <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a little secret in valuation. If you're ever asked to value something, never come back with a nice round number. Don't tell me the target price for a company is $40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal point will do in creating an illusion that you actually know more than you do. <laughs> when in doubt, add decimals. <laughs> Here's a sad truth about valuation. In most valuations, people decide what the number should be, and then the entire process is reverse engineering the number. It's not the way science is supposed to work, but this is definitely not science. So with bias, my advice is don't fight it. Don't act like it's not there. Be real about the fact that there's bias, put it down in statistics. There's a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics. Have you heard of that? In Bayesian statistics is supposed to state your priors before you do a study. So the world knows what your bias is. So when they look at the results of your study, they can read the results based on what bias. So you can say, look, I got paid 50 million by Pfizer to do the study. And then you find that a Pfizer drug work better, works better than all the competitors' drugs. I know I should discount your finding at least a little bit. So be open about bias. Second stuff, second misconception, that if you do a good valuation, you will get 
the right answer. You know, when this process gets started very early in life, you go to kindergarten, the kindergarten teacher puts a sheet of paper in front of you, two plus three. If you get five, she pats you on the back and says, congratulations, you got the right answer. If you get any, if you're still wondering what two plus three is, you shouldn't be in this class, but that's a different problem. But if you get any other answer, she says, you did something wrong because you got the wrong answer. And that gets drummed into you, right? If you do things right, you get the right answer. If you got the wrong answer, you must have done something wrong. That's exactly the wrong lesson to bring into this class. Especially with my MBA class, as I told you, there are lots of recovering engineers and mathematicians and scientists in that class. Like clockwork, in the 36 years I've taught this class, here's what happens in that class. By the seventh or eighth week of the class, about 15 or 20 people in the class, out of a class of 300, that's about 10% of the class, maybe 7% will show up in my office. They'll put a valuation down, say, I'm done with the valuation of my company. Could you tell me whether I got the right answer? I don't even look at the valuation. I push it back across the table and say, I don't know what the right answer is. And their faith in the system starts to crack, right? When you're teaching this class, you don't know what the value of every company is. To which my response is, if I knew what the value of every company was, why would I be teaching this class? I own an island in Hawaii with a castle on top or something. But half the people, when I give this response, can't handle it, not knowing what the right answer is. You know what happens to them? They become fixed income people. Let's face it, it's so much more comfortable sitting there with the bond, right? Maturity is given, coupons given, face value is given. I let them go. Healthy recognition early on that value equities is not free. The other half says, look, this is kind of fun. If you don't know what the right answer is, I can never, ever convincingly be wrong. Think about that. That's one of the great things about equities. I tell you to buy a stock because I think it's undervalued. It goes down five years in a row. You come back to why he asked me to buy the stock. You know what my answer is? Not a long enough time horizon. <laughs> it gets ba goes bankrupt in the way. Well, the system got in the way. Otherwise, Lehman would be trading over 50 times earnings right now. I kind of like the fact that there's no right answer, but it is going to make you uncomfortable. Because when you're done with the evaluation, you get a number, you want to check it. And what I'm telling you up front is, there's nothing I can tell you that will tell you whether it's right or wrong. I can tell you it's internally consistent, but that's about it. But I'm going to say, go, put a follow-up to this, that's going to make no sense, but I'll back it up. Not all companies are equally easy or equally difficult to value. In fact, to make this example more specific, I'm going to take you back about almost three years now. March of 2019, in one week, two companies went public during the same week, both with names that you will recognize. One was Lyft. Those of you who don't remember, Lyft actually came to the market before Uber did. First ride-sharing company to go public. The second company that went public in the same week was Levi Strauss. You think Levi Strauss didn't go public till 2019? Levi Strauss went public in the 1970s, was taken back private, but it was going back public again. You ready for the first question? You got Levi Strauss and Lyft. Two companies going public. If you're valuing these two companies, which of these two companies are you going to be able to value more precisely? You're going to have an easier time valuing the company. Levi Strauss or Lyft and tell me why. Which of the two companies would be easier to value. Levi Strauss or Lyft? Not sure. Want to try? Levi Strauss or Lyft? Which company is going to be easier to value? Levi Strauss. And what is it about Levi Strauss that makes it easier to value? Well, okay, so they like they are like probably not like uh, they're a very established market, right? Like they're selling. How does Levi Strauss make its money? They sell jeans. They sell jeans. They've been around 150 years. We know what business, they have a business model. We know how it works. We know where it works. They have lots of history. So you can pull up 50 years of history. So you have lots of data. You understand the company. It's making money. It's got a business model. It's easier to value than a company like Lyft. Money losing, small revenues. And we don't know whether ride sharing can ever make money. No ride sharing company on the face of this earth has figured out how to make money. Not Didi, not Grab, not Ola, not Uber, not. So if I ask you which of these two companies are going to, is going to be easier to value, you're going to get a more precise value. The answer is simple. It's Levi Strauss. 
But then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Which of these two companies is there a bigger payoff to doing valuation? Remember, valuation is about finding market mistakes, right? Which of these two companies are you more likely to find a mistake? Uh, Lyft, because uh, everybody valuates differently. In fact, I'll make it even easier for you. Most people don't even try to value Lyft, including most people buying and selling the stock. Why? Because they use uncertainty as a shield. Too uncertain, we're not going to try to value companies, this company. So if you value Lyft, you're way ahead of the crowd. But if you value Levi Strauss, what made Levi Strauss easy for you to value made it easy to value for everybody looking at the company. So if you want to keep valuing Coca-Cola and Kraft Heinz over and over and over again, good luck to you. But you're playing with companies where the chance of finding a market mistake is tiny. People often ask me, why do you spend so much time valuing young companies? companies in transition, because they said, that's where you'll find the biggest market mistakes. So here's the greatest irony. The payoff to valuation is greater for young companies and for mature companies, for emerging market companies and developed market companies. In the middle of a crisis, March of 2020, was the time to value Boeing, because everybody had given up. So as you think about a company to pick to value, I have some advice for you. Go where it's darkest. Sounds like a advice for a horror movie, but it's akin to a horror movie. Find a nice Turkish consumer product company. There are no nice Tur Turkish consumer product companies now. How about a nice Ukrainian mining company to value? That'll be interesting. You don't know whether that company will be around three weeks from now after Russia decides what to do about this. But my point is a bigger one. Go where the uncertainty is greatest because that's where you find the biggest market mistake. So uncertainty is a feature, not a bug. This is a line you'll see me use over and over again. What I mean by that is people try to make uncertainty go away. But it is reality. It's what we live in. You might as well face up to it. And in fact, turn it to your advantage. But bias got uncertainty. Let's talk about the third misconception in valuation. If I make my model bigger, it'll get better. You know what I'm talking about? I'll give away my age by telling you how I valued my first company. To value my first company, 1980, I actually wrote to the company for an annual report. No, physically, with, with a pen and paper. No, not even type. I wrote, please send me your annual report. You're saying, why don't you go online and just download the report? What online? In 1980, and two weeks later, to give the company credit, they mailed me back the annual report. Then I sat down to value the company with a ledger sheet. You guys have never seen a ledger sheet, have you? It's just a blank sheet of paper with lines drawn through it. A calculator and a pencil, always a pencil, never a pen. You learn very quickly never to write things in pen because you know what happens? If you screw up, you gotta go fix all those numbers. Pencil's a lot easier. And one by one, I estimated each number they calculated. You're saying, so what? When you value a company on a ledger sheet with a calculator and a pencil, guess how many line items there will be in your valuation? Remember, every single number has to be hand calculated. Almost by definition, you're not gonna have 500 line items, you'll go crazy. Valuations used to be parsimonious, simply because we had no choice. Today, with Microsoft Excel and macros, I mean, uh, you guys had the training the street people go through yet? They'll teach you how to become an Excel ninja. You can hit this combination of keys, every alternate line turns gray, et cetera, et cetera, all those skills you need to really value a company. But with Excel, you can build big models that get bigger over time. 50 line items, 100, 250. So here's the reality. Models have become more complex over time because we have more data and more powerful tools. You think, so what, that's good, right? Two things happen when you build these really complex models. The first is you don't know who's running who. Are you running the model? or is the model running you? It's kind of an existential question. 
that if you ever work for an investment bank, you're going to discover on Saturday night at 11, it's a model that's been running you for the last nine months. So go get me that, you go get it that. You get me a cup of coffee, go get it a cup. It's the, it's the boss. The second is the model becomes a black box. You know what I mean by a black box? You enter numbers and something happens. You have no idea what. A number pops out on the other side. And you start writing things like the model valued the company at. If you ever see those words in a report, you know what the analyst is desperately trying to tell you, right? It's not my fault. The model did it. So I'm gonna make a suggestion. When you find that you're entering numbers into a black box, including one of my spreadsheets, stop. The model is your tool. Excel is a tool, but that's all it is. And less is more in the physical sciences. It's a principle called the principle of parsimony. It's also called Occam's razor. And essentially it says, when you're trying to explain a physical phenomenon, start with the simplest explanation of it before you make it of Einstein. Valuation, the same rule applies. When you're trying to value something, start with the simplest model to value it rather than building this incredibly complex model. Now, last summer, my youngest son, who's then a junior at Yale, had a job at a, at a hedge fund and he was asked to value companies. That was his job. So the summer in the middle of the summer, he called me and he says, dad, I want some advice, which is very unusual because he never comes to me for, some, for advice. So I said, what? He said, I'm valuing a company and they've asked me to do a three statement forecast. You know what three statement forecast is? A lot of investment banks love three statement forecasts. Anybody? What are the three statements? Income statement, balance sheet statement, or cash flows. You forecast every single line item for the next 20 years. One of the most useless exercises in valuation, but every investment bank does it. He said, you know, they asked me to do three statement forecasts. Can you tell me how to do it? And I said, I would if I knew. He said, teach valuation. You've never done a three statement forecast. I said, in 40 years of valuing, a company, valuing companies, I've never once in my life forecast all three financial statements. He said, don't you need numbers from those statements? I said, I need six. Why are we forecasting 600 other numbers that I don't care about? Don't add detail for the sake of adding detail. Keep things simple. And it's a principle I'll try to follow as we talk about value companies. So let's take these three big forces, none of which are technical issues, but they kind of invade valuation and talk about how they create problems in valuation. So you got bias coming from who pays you, how much you get paid, what you know about the company. You have uncertainty coming from the what. Let's face it, you don't control it. Depends on the company, depends on the time you're valuing the company. And then you have complexity. Some of it self-imposed, some of it coming from the fact that we have more data and more models. Bias, complexity, and uncertainty. They form the three sides of what I call the Bermuda Triangle of valuation. You guys heard of the Bermuda Triangle? This is mythical area in the Atlantic where ships and planes seem to disappear, at least in, in, the, in the myth. The Bermuda Triangle evaluation is where good sense disappears. Bias, uncertainty, and complexity kick in. And if, if they kick in enough, it's amazing how people start to do really stupid things simply because they got sucked into that middle section. So let's talk a little bit about how you can put a number on an asset. And I'm gonna say upfront, there are only three ways you can put a number on an asset. The first is to do what I call intrinsic valuation. Sounds fancy, but you value the asset based on its cash flows, its growth and risk. You adjust the time value of money. You come, that's intrinsic valuation. Discounted cash flow valuation is the most common form of that, but that's intrinsic value. The second, as I said in the last session, is rather than try to value the asset, you price it based on what, what other people are paying for similar assets. In fact, if you're struggling with that notion, think about how you decide how much to pay for an apartment or a house, right? A realtor shows you the apartment and puts up a number, right? How did the realtor come up with a number? Did she or he do a discounted cash flow valuation of the apartment? No, they just looked at other apartments in the neighborhood, saw what they sold for, adjusted for the fact that you have an extra bedroom or a bigger backyard. That's pricing. So you can do an intrinsic valuation, you can do pricing. And as I said, in some cases, 
there might be this additional value contingent. If your cash flows are contingent on something happening, you might add a premium. I gave you the example of undeveloped resources for a commodity company, a pharmaceutical company with a patent working its way through the pipeline. Intrinsic valuation, pricing. Whenever somebody sends me a number for a company, the first thing I check is what have they done? Have they done an intrinsic valuation? Have they done a pricing? Are they putting some option story? Because everything in valuation has to fall into one of these three buckets. So let's talk about behind all of these approaches, intrinsic valuation, pricing, and option pricing, what it is that we're assuming when we use these approaches. If you're looking at publicly traded companies, and you're an investor using any of these approaches, you know what you're already starting with is an assumption, right? That markets make mistakes, that you can find those mistakes. If you truly believed in efficient markets, you know how long this class should last? When I ask you what's the value of Peloton, what will you do? Open up the paper or check online to see what the price is. I think it dropped below 25 today and say, the value of Peloton is 2488 because that's what the market thinks it is. In a world with efficient markets, there's really no point to doing valuation because it's going to explain the market price. But the, the difference between the approaches is what kinds of mistakes you think markets make and how markets correct those mistakes. I know that sounds mysterious, but let's take intrinsic valuation or its most common form, discounted cash flow valuation, and see what we're assuming when we use discounted cash flow valuation. The essence of discounted cash flow valuation is simple. The value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. Nothing more, nothing less. It's that first class in finance that we all take. Remember that class? You pulled out your time value tables and that's pretty much it. Here's what you're trying to do. Philosophically, when we do discounted cash flow valuation, we're assuming that everything has an intrinsic value and then we're just going to try to estimate it. I call this, it's a little bit like the search for the Holy Grail. You heard of the legend of the Holy Grail? For thousands of years, people have been looking for it. How many have found it? I think Indiana Jones came really close, but then he kind of slipped, it slipped away. But the reality is everybody keeps looking, nobody finds it. Intrinsic value is very much like it. We all keep looking, but we never find it. But we keep the faith. And there are a lot of people who don't. And if you break down discounted cash flow models down, no matter how complicated they get, here are the ingredients you're going to see. You're going to see a life for the asset. So if I give you a 10-year building with a 10-year life, that's the life of the asset. I'll give you cash flows during that life, which are expected cash flows. And I'll give you a risk-adjusted discount rate. That's it, right? Every DCF model, those are the ingredients. But let's dig a little deeper. Let's think about why, as investors, we do valuation. I don't do valuation, and I'll talk for myself because I can't talk for you, because I'm intellectually curious. I don't lie awake and say, I wonder what Facebook is worth right now. Maybe you do, but then you should consider some therapy or psychiatric counseling. The reality is you shouldn't be doing valuation because you're intellectually curious. There are lots of things to be curious about. This ain't one of them. We do valuation because we're greedy. We want to make money. So let's see what has to happen for us to make money on discounted cash flow valuations. Ready? First, we have to assume that markets make mistakes. You know what? That's an easy assumption. Everybody will agree with you, and including the firmest believers in efficient markets. Markets make mistakes, and they make some real doozies. Second, you have to assume that you can find those mistakes with your metrics and models. Now we're on dangerous ground. You know why? What's a track record of people who claim to find market mistakes? Well, let me reframe the question. Remind me again how much the average active portfolio manager beats the index by every year. You know what the answer to the question is? Minus 1.5%. Let me repeat that again. The average active portfolio manager delivers 1.5% less return than you could have made just putting your money in an index fund. Strangest profession on the face of the earth. I mean, the analogy I'd offer is like starting a plumbing business called Floods Are Us. <laughs> and here's what you do. I have a leak in my house. I call you when you leave a flood. You insist on getting paid. You won't last as a plumber for very long, right? But let's say you're special. 
you actually have found a metric or model that works. So let's give them the mistake a name, Peloton. You love that Peloton instructor that's biasing your valuation. So let's put that to the side. Let's say you valued Peloton at $40 and you think the market has moved to low, 20, below 25. You go out and you buy a million shares of Peloton. You're saying, I don't have the money for a million. Let's act like you do. It'll put more stakes on the game. So you bought a market mistake, right? Let's say you're right. The market's made a mistake. What's the third assumption that you need to make for you to make money on this mistake? And we talked about this a little bit the last session. The markets will correct. The markets will have to correct. So how the heck are you going to get the markets to do that? You could create a Reddit group and tell people Peloton is cheap, Peloton, but nobody's reading your group. You're a group of one. You're not Roaring Kitty. You have no idea who Roaring Kitty is. When you, after the class is over, type in Roaring Kitty, type in GameStop and see what happens. But basically, my point is you can't control what the market does. The only consolation price I can offer you is if you're truly correct that the market's making a mistake, the longer your time horizon, the greater the chance the market will correct its mistakes. Already I've given away the ingredient that you need to be able to be an investor who uses intrinsic valuation. What type of time horizon do you need to have as an investor? Not three months, not six months, definitely not two weeks. You need a time horizon that runs into the years. And maybe then you improve the odds. Even then you're not guaranteed. Only people with long time horizons can really go with intrinsic valuation, even if they believe everything about it. So let's take a closer look at intrinsic valuation and talk a little bit about what its pluses and minuses are. You know the old Warren Buffett, I know a lot of people here might be Warren Buffett, I, I, and I like a great deal of what Warren Buffett says about companies. In fact, one of my favorite expressions from Buffett is he doesn't buy stocks, he buys businesses. He doesn't buy a thousand shares of a company, he buys a piece of a business. If you truly believe that saying, then intrinsic valuation is how you should approach putting a number on a business, right? Because you're valuing it as a business. And to value it as a business, you need to understand what it does. You cannot value Peloton without understanding its basic business model, which is shifting as we talk, right? When Peloton started, what was the basic business model? sell essentially $2,500 exercise bikes. That is the first piece. And after you bought the equipment, how do they collect money from you on a continuous basis? You paid a monthly subscription of what, $40 or $50 a month. And I remember when Peloton came out and an equity research analyst on CNBC said, everybody in my building has a Peloton. My reaction was, you're hanging out in the wrong building guy. Get out and walk 20 blocks the other direction because most Americans can't afford to pay $2,500 for an exercise bike and definitely not $50 a month. What changed during the pandemic? What did Peloton increasingly, what gave them that rise in the price? They weren't selling that much more equipment, but they also offered a subscription, I think $13 a month you don't have to own the bike, you just essentially get the fitness classes on a continuous basis, which you could then use on your own bike. The business model has swiveled from being built around equipment to being built around subscriptions. But my point is you cannot really value Peloton until you dig into the basics of that model. Can they sustain that model? What will happen if Netflix introduces a new add-on subscription called Netflix Fit? I think of how much bigger their base is. They're $5 a month. They said, we'll offer you 200 Netflix fitness classes. That might destroy. So those are the things I need to deal with when I value Peloton, which means I have to understand the cash flow characteristics, the business model, the risk in the company, which is a good thing, right? And finally, if you, you know, if you really are buying a set of cash flows, you're not buying a stock. As long as the cash flows are there, what does it matter to you whether investors agree with you or not? You, you see what I'm saying? Let's say you buy Peloton because you think it's undervalued given its cash flows. And then the stock price drops. Technically, and I'm, you're going to see why I use the word technically, you shouldn't care. You better, as long as the cash flows are still there, 
you can collect the cash flows. That said though, psychologically, when you open up your online brokerage account and you see Peloton down 40%, do you feel it? I guarantee you, no matter how much you tell me you're an intrinsic value person, you're gonna look at that 40%, oh my God, I feel poorer right now. But at least in theory, you're buying cash flows. You don't care whether people agree with you or not. So that's the upside. You would understand the business, the business model, in a sense, immunized from the market. You're saying, what's the downside? It is a little more work. It's easier to price a company based on a PE ratio and comparables or a revenue multiple and comparables than to do a discounted cash flow model. Second, it is true that if you have so much bias in this process, you can alter the numbers to deliver whatever result you want. People can mess with the model. You can claim you're doing a DCF. I tell people I'd rather have a good pricing than a bad intrinsic valuation where you kind of mess with the numbers. But here's something that I think we need to think about. Is it possible that if you do intrinsic valuation of companies that every company in the market looks overvalued to you? or every company in a sector looks overvalued. Absolutely. There's nothing in intrinsic valuation that requires that some companies come out as cheap. You're saying, so what? Let's say you're an equity mutual fund manager at Fidelity. What's your job? To buy shares in publicly traded companies. You believe in intrinsic valuation. Intrinsic valuation is telling you nothing looks cheap. In theory, what should you do? You should sell all your shares Put your money in cash and go to your boss and say, look, you know, I think stocks are over. You'll be fired <laughs> within a few seconds if that happened. But since we're talking about Warren Buffett, let's talk about what made him the legend he is today. In 1969, it's exactly where he ended up. He was a believer in intrinsic valuation. He looked around the market and he said, I can't find anything that comes through my screens is cheap. Does anybody know what he did in 1969? He had a partnership then. He liquidated the partnership and sent out a letter. It's on Google. You can, you can pull it up on Google search. One of the most famous investment liquidation letters of all time, where he said, I have a choice. I can either bend my model and measure of intrinsic value to find things that look cheap, but then I'd be breaking my philosophy, or I can return the money back to you who are investors in my partnership. I'm choosing to return the money. That requires not just courage, but the power over your destiny that most portfolio managers don't have. So this is something that a lot of VCs have struggled with, a lot of private equity investors have struggled with in the last decade as pricing keeps pushing up and up. At some point in time, you have to decide whether you need to stay in the game and continue to be a VC or a private equity investor, or whether you just say, look, this game has become much too rich for my taste, I'm walking away. So when you think about when discounted cash flow, so let's say you look at the pluses and minuses, you decide you're going to go with discounted cash flow valuation. Let's think about the types of investments where discounted cash flow valuation is likely to work best. First, you can use discounted cash flow valuation. This is stating the obvious, but I'm going to state it anyway. Only if your asset generates cash flows. That's why I said in the last session, you can't value Bitcoin. You cannot value gold. You cannot value a Picasso. They're not cash flow generating assets. Okay. And if you take that to the next step, it works best for investors who have long time horizons rather than short time horizons. And if you can be the catalyst that causes the price to adjust value, remember we said we're trusting the market to correct. If you can somehow be the catalyst, your, the odds improve in your favor. Right? How can that ever happen? Go to Carl Icahn or Bill Ackman. Usually they're categorized as activist investors, right? What do they do? They buy shares in what they think are undervalued companies. And then do they just stay quiet? No, they get out there and make a lot of noise. Carl Icahn gets on CNBC and says, this company is undervalued. So what are they hoping to accomplish? They're hoping that in the process of being public, they can push the price up to the value. If you're a value investor and you can provide the catalyst, you can improve your odds. And finally, and this is psychological, 
for you to be able to succeed with intrinsic valuation, you have to be willing to often be alone in your views. This is not something we all control, right? If you think back to your lifetime, some of us are more susceptible to peer group pressures than others. You wanted to hang out with the cool kids in high school or the athletes or whatever it is. I'll tell you something, if you, if you crave pure pressure, you know, pure affirmation, intrinsic valuation is not for you. It's not gonna work for you. Psychologically, some of us are just not designed to be an intrinsic valuation because when people disagree with us, we can't handle it. So what do we do? We bend the numbers so that we are in agreement with everybody else. What I'm trying to say is, when people ask me what's the best way to approach putting a number in a company, I say it depends on the asset you're looking at and it depends on you. I have a class that I teach that I've never taught at Stern called investment philosophies. It's basically what's the right philosophy for you as an investor. And the answer is it's the one that best fits you. So next session, we'll talk about pricing and options, but you're already seeing the pieces come into play in terms of the choices you have as an investor. Thank <laughs> you.